As we all predicted when LeBron got to L.A., the Lakers hired Frank Vogel to be their new head coach. It is a three-year deal. Vogel previously coached in Orlando and Indiana, where he battled LeBron in the conference finals multiple times. He'll be joined by former head coach Jason Kidd, who will reportedly have a prominent role on his bench. Nick, what do you make of the hire? I mean, looking at you. You go, you go, see, you go. Looking at you, Colin. Because I want to hear what you say. This is the thing. When you were reading it, I, I changed my mind. We were going to go to Nick to have him start, but. But it even said season. Go ahead, but go yes. ahead. So, Nick. But this is the, Jenna, I, I just wanted to say this first. I would feel a lot different if we started the search with him part of the process. If Vogel would have been part, we're going to interview five people. We're going to look at Jawan Howard. I mean, because he wasn't even part of the first four candidates. No. So if we, if we start that way, I can be unhappy with who you select and believe they're going to select someone. You could have selected someone better. I could, but if you're in the search and then you go, you finish the search, select the coach. Oh, he turns you down because based on what's been said, Monty turned them down first before Ty Lue had a chance to turn them down. So now you get two coaches turn you down, you reopen the search, and it's a one-person search. No one else is interviewed. I, that, that right there, it's going to be hard for me unless you just have some superior coaching skills or you have an unbelievable resume for me to overcome just the whole process of how we got to whoever they selected, Nick. If Frank Vogel was hired this offseason to be the coach of any other team, it might not make the show. But if it did make the show, here's what I would have said for any other team, any team. How the hell did this guy get a job this quickly? We have documented evidence that he is not a good NBA coach. Documented evidence. Now, maybe he'll turn it around third time's a charm. He did a nice job in Indiana. And he got into a couple conference finals, Paul George, Roy Hibbert. They even got to a game seven against LeBron's Miami Heat team. And at that point, he looked like a really good head coach. Then yes. Paul George got hurt, they had a bad year. The following year, they got bounced in the first round in seven by, I think, the Raptors. And Larry Bird in Indiana said, we need a change. And at that moment, people thought Frank Vogel was a good coach. And he got hired to take over an up-and-coming Orlando team. Immediately, didn't have to miss no time. Go, Orlando. They had won 35 wins. They were trying to make a push for the playoffs. Coming off 35 wins, they won 25 games. They won 29 games. He gets fired. And they make the playoffs immediately without him. <laughs> same roster. Top six scores the exact same. Orlando last year with 25 wins. This year with 42 wins. Same roster. Maybe have some of the same young, talented players, lottery picks that he was supposed to develop. Just like the Lakers besides LeBron. This is baffling that Frank Vogel gets a third bite at this apple for any team. Much less a team with immense pressure to win immediately and right now. I, I do hope there are a few other things about this that are like the, the Jason Kidd part of this. They clearly wanted to hire Jason Kidd. They were so upset by the optics of it. People were like, well, I mean, he, he stabbed coaches and play, teammates in the back as a player. He had a domestic violence allegation. He yep. got a DUI. Crime, yes. he, had a, he, he, he finagled his way out of Brooklyn. He went to Milwaukee, did some. So they were so upset by the optics of that. Do you remember after they interviewed Jason Kidd, who they clearly wanted to hire? They leaked to the media, oh, it was a fake interview. It was just, it was just a courtesy interview. And now they, they make Vogel take him on a staff because Vogel will take all the things Ty Lue didn't want to take. Three-year deal, no problem. You, you pick my staff, no problem. I'm just happy to get another coaching job. This is baffling, but it should put to rest this notion. LeBron James, the puppet master. LeBron James, remember, he in charge of everything in LA. He wasn't in charge of this. And Frank Vogel, if he's going to be a good coach, he's going to have to prove it to me. Because I watched Orlando last year be a disaster, and this year with the same players be a playoff team. Well, it can't be too baffling, because Luke Walton, who basically had a disastrous season this year with the Lakers, didn't have to wait more than a minute and a half, and he got a job in Sacramento. But then, then, then tell me why. Tell me, tell me what the Lakers saw in Vogel that either we don't see or fans don't see or, or the media's not seen, that they thought this is the guy that's going to come in, going to help us win, going to help us land a free agent, going to help us get back into the playoffs. Like, just I, someone explain it to me. Well, I can't tell you what the Lakers saw. I don't know what Kurt Rambis, because I've been, I, it would be hard for me to look through life through Kurt Rambis' shades. But there's something Kurt Rambis saw. I, I don't see it. And if Kurt Rambis is a part of your selection as far as you selecting a coach, 
There's no telling what you might end up with. But I'm gonna tell you this though, there wasn't people calling. This wasn't a coveted job. I wonder if they didn't hire Frank Vogel, how many more coaches, the credible NBA coaches, could they have interviewed? Because you already had two turn the job down. This right here with LeBron James, this is embarrassing. One of the stellar franchises with one of the great players we've ever had. Nobody wanted this job. Well, I, and I think I can answer your question very directly. What they saw in Frank Vogel, Rob Palenka and Kurt Rambis saw a guy that was not going to fight them for any modicum of control. Yes. Rob Palenka they wanted to keep power. runs the Los Angeles Lakers. He is the final word in all of it. Well, this is very, now he might have to report to Jeannie Buss, who then I guess reports to Linda Rambis, who then, you know, <laughs> but, but Rob Palenka, I thought Brian Windhorst, to his credit, laid this out very intelligently in an article people should read. It's two types of coaching hires. Yes. Bold ones <laughs> or, or ones where you want to hold on to as much power as possible. So you hire a coach, you're going to take a three-year deal. You're gonna let me pick your staff, no problem. I just want it, man. I thought I was gonna to have to go be an assistant for years before I get another opportunity. No problem. I get to coach yeah. the Lakers. We'll be in the playoffs. Sure. So this was about Rob Palinka consolidating his power. When Magic walked out the door, we thought Palinka could lose some power. They bring in Masai. They try to get Bob Myers. They mm -hmm. call up R.C. Buford. Now we know why that plan never was, happened. Was never discussed. No, no, no. And also we know that maybe Palinka's quest for power is one of the reasons Magic walked out the door. And I'm going to say, there's one other thing that I want to say that's in reference to this show. Because when we were first talking about the Lakers coaching search, and it was Monty Williams, Ty Lu, and Jawan Howard were the three candidates we were discussing, I believe, at the time. Jason Kidd, I don't think, was discussed. Steven Jackson was on this set. And people got very mad at him. Because Steven Jackson said, I'll be honest with you, I don't care who they pick, I'm just glad it's a black coach. And his point was, black coaches don't get the opportunities some of their white contemporaries do. Black coaches certainly don't get to be Frank Vogel. Don't ever play, fail in one spot, have a disastrous tenure in another spot that we find out immediately thereafter the team's better without you. One year out of coaching, go coach the Lakers. Like Ty Lu, everyone's like, oh, Ty Lu, they offered Ty Lu the same contract they offered Frank Vogel. Ty Lu was a success when three NBA Finals won a championship, and it's just ridiculous. See, on, on the other side of that, because I believe there's another argument on that, it's hard to argue when two African Americans turn down the job. Now, maybe if you have a different topic, you've been like, oh, we, we might go, yes, they might not get the opportunity, but when two brothers turn down the job, that's not the time to be asking, well, man, African-American coaches don't get, yeah, that part is true, but two guys turn this job down. Right, but I guess the only thing I'd say is Ty Lu being offered the same contract you offered to Frank Vogel, like that. That was a conversation we should have had before Frank Vogel. So sure. I mean, I, I understand, I understand your point, but go ahead. The biggest question now is going to be if they can land or what free agent they are going to land. And you wonder how much now Vogel is going to affect that move. All right, let's, Palenka, move, man. Yeah, let's move on to the Philadelphia 76ers. Their season came to an end last night on Kawhi. One of the best starting fives in the league, but a starting five which played only 21 games together all season long. They went all in to try and win this year, trading for Jimmy Butler and Tobias Harris, and they came up short to the Toronto Raptors. Here is Joel Embiid after the loss. I don't know, game seven, losing a game that way, um, you know, last shot um, after a hard-fought game, uh, I feel like we had a chance. Uh, you know, a lot of things go through your mind and uh, it sucks. Joel? You've been here for almost all of the process. Where would you say the process is right now? And you just played the, the most minutes you've ever played in regulation. Are, are, you, are you tired? I don't give a damn about the process. Um, and no, I'm not tired. All right, and a lot of questions now surrounding this team as they head into the offseason with the coaching, with some personnel, with contracts that are going to expire and whatnot. What do you think are the biggest issues facing this team as we move now? To well, they have to figure out a way to survive when that man goes to the bench. I mean, last night was another just golden example of what's been the story of the entire series and the entire season for them. When Joel Embiid goes to the bench, they fall apart. Last night he played 45 minutes, 45 minutes. They outscored the Raptors by 10 in those 45 minutes. In the three minutes he sat, they lost by 12. Greg Monroe came in the game for 101 seconds. They lost those 101 seconds by nine points. 
They have no they, they have no answer for when he goes to the bench. That was the story of the whole series was they could not account for when Embiid wasn't out there. The other element is one of the reasons they can't account for when Embiid's not out there is the other part of the process. Their other young star is not a young star right now. He is a potential star and he does a lot of things really well. But in these close games at the end of playoff games, you saw it. They basically had three shot clock violations. Only one was called a shot clock violations, but three straight possessions, 85-85, 87-85 was the score. Coming out of a timeout where they had shot clock violation or they had a de facto shot clock violation. This was the first one after a timeout. They then took a 27 foot three because the clock was winding down, turned the ball over. Like their offense grinded to a halt and it was terrible in part because they're playing four on five offensively. So those are all issues for them that predate what they're doing with Jimmy Butler and Tobias Harris. They need a point guard. And that's why you can't run your offense. I don't care what the coach says. I don't care what Ben Simmons says. I get so sick of people say, oh man, he's a point guard. Oh, okay. Why can't you run your offense at the end of the game? Because he doesn't have the intangibles. Just because a guy can dribble does not make him a point guard. You need someone to be able to set it up. And like I said last week, let's not forget Markel Fultz not being on this team it showed again because the process wasn't about just those two players. Right. There was another player involved that was supposed to be part of that process, and he is a pure point guard. Now, he is going through, he went through a whole bunch of things and everything off the court, but that's where they have a hole in their roster. So for me, what do they need to do? Like, they need to be able to fill that void. They need to be able to get a point guard. Now, I do believe that Ben Simmons is a special talent. But when you get in games like this, and I'm going to say it again, it becomes important to be able to shoot the basketball outside of the restricted area. The biggest game of his career, he shoots the ball five times. He's an all-star. You would have to, man, a guy would have to have a broken wrist to, to, to be an all-star and not shoot the ball in critical situations like this. Why do they struggle when Joel Embiid's off? Because they're challenged offensively. Ben Simmons is a hole. He is a liability. They are basically playing five defenders on four offensive players. And he does not have, at this point in his career, the skill that big guards like Magic Johnson, LeBron James, to set up, understand passing lanes, understand those things, comfortable enough dribbling the basketball with both hands. He is not that player. You can try to make him out to be, but he's not that player at this stage. And I do understand that he is young. I do understand that. Yeah. But at this stage of his career, he's not that player. So do you think this team looks different next year? Well, that's the thing is, I, I still think despite all of that, if you're Philly, because you have traded away the draft picks, because even if guys walk, you're not going to have a ton of space because you are going to re-up Simmons at some point. I do think that you have to do all you can to keep Jimmy Butler. And you got to do all you can to keep Tobias Harris. If I had to pick one of the two, I'd pick Jimmy Butler. But you're, they are going to, now Zaire Smith, their first round pick this year, will be back. Like they will, they should hopefully be able to develop more of a bench. But it's going to be about, can you keep the players that you traded away future assets for? I, I believe their ownership will attempt to. And does Ben Simmons do something he clearly did not do this offseason? which is put in the requisite work to add another layer to his game, even if that's a multi-offseason process. He didn't even, to me, get to step one of that process between years one and two of his actual active career. Yeah, they can't sign Tobias to the max. They can't sign Jimmy Butler to the max. Like, both of those guys have to come together. Like, what's, what's best for Philly? Is both of those guys come together and say, we want to be part of these young guys developing. We're willing to take a little bit less to be able to stay here. All right. Take a break. Coming up to James Harden.